I've had a few medical students feedback to me saying they would love a tutorial on groin hernias. They really can be quite confusing. For example, what are the differences between direct and indirect hernias? How do you examine them? Amongst other very good questions. Well, in this video tutorial, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about groin hernias to help you pass your exams and, of course, to prepare you that a little bit more for life as a good junior doctor. Let's start by taking a look at the anatomy that you need to understand. So the key landmarks when it comes to inguinal and femoral hernias are the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, which is the lateral most bony tip of this part of the pubis. And connecting the two, of course, is the inguinal ligament. Now if we start below the inguinal ligament, let's add in the important structures from lateral to medial. So firstly, it's the femoral nerve, then the common femoral artery, the common femoral vein, and don't forget, of course, there's some space containing some loose fatty tissue and some lymphatics, and the textbooks also mention the node of cloquet, which is sometimes found. Now, the femoral vein and this medial area containing lymphatics and fatty tissue are actually inside the femoral canal, which is essentially just an extension of the transversalis fascia. And it is in this femoral canal where femoral hernias are found. Now, what you need to remember is that this whole area is very non-compliant, and that is why the neck of a femoral hernia can very easily become pinched, causing strangulation and or obstruction. So let's now concentrate on the area above the inguinal ligament the external oblique with its fibres drawn here in the direction as if you were going to put your hands in your pockets. And then we have the superficial and the markings of the deep inguinal ring. The superficial inguinal ring is essentially a defect in the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle and it can be found superior and medial to the pubic tubercle. And of course this serves as the exit of the spermatic cord as it makes its way down into the scrotum. Now if we were to take a knife and incise along the fibres of the external oblique aponeurosis up to and including the superficial ring, we could then open the external oblique and have a look inside the inguinal canal. So this is the superior leaf of the external oblique that we've opened and here's the inferior leaf and here is the inguinal ligament which is actually just the folded fibres of external oblique. So the posterior wall, this cream colour behind the spermatic cord, is the transversalis fascia and then laterally also forming the lateral border of the deep ring are the fibers of internal oblique in the dark red and the lighter red is the transversus abdominis and these two muscles course to form the superior border of the inguinal canal and then they both coalesce to form what's called the conjoint tendon now the conjoint tendon is the medial border of the inguinal canal so to help us understand the relative positions of indirect and direct hernias, just going to add in now the inferior epigastric vessels. So the inferior epigastric vessels will be found just medial to the deep inguinal ring. So any hernia originating lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels is an indirect hernia, protruding through the deep ring and into the spermatic cord. Direct hernia takes a more direct route into the inguinal canal, protruding directly through the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. So why are indirect hernias found actually within the cord? As you may remember from your embryology classes that you may have had, the testicle, depicted here by this orange spherical type object, originates in the retroperitoneum as a fetus and it descends down the posterior abdominal wall and eventually makes its way to the lower anterior abdominal wall and it needs to find its way into the scrotum. These three horizontal lines denote some of the layers of the anterior abdominal wall and as the testicle descends it invaginates through these layers of the abdominal wall and takes them with it into the scrotum. Now these layers of the anterior abdominal wall now form the layers of the spermatic cord as well. So the layers of the spermatic cord are derived from the layers of the anterior abdominal wall and the peritoneum has walled off and this is the remnant of the peritoneum now going to be known as the tunica vaginalis surrounds the testicle in congenital inguinal hernias this peritoneum may not close off which then permits passage of intra-abdominal contents into the scrotum and inguinal canal and that's called a patent processus vaginalis 
but most of the time indirect hernias form due to weakness at the deep ring and intra-abdominal contents whether that be fat or bowel pushes its way through the deep ring and so has to end up within the spermatic cord taking peritoneum with it. Now in practice this is all you really need to know about the epidemiology of groin hernias. Firstly it's little old ladies mainly that get femoral hernias Often you see them as an emergency and their presenting complaint isn't, oh doctor, I've got a painful lump in my groin. It may be vomiting with or without abdominal pain. So in these situations, always look in the groin. Now if femoral hernias mainly affect females, inguinal hernias are mainly a male problem. I think the male to female ratio may be beyond the region of 12 to 1. There are four aspects in history taking when your patient has a suspected hernia. One, ask them about the pain. Do they have any? Is it brought on by straining, for example, coughing or laughing? Is the pain constant? Two, ask them about any lump. Have they noticed a lump? Is it always present? Does it reduce spontaneously when they lie down? Or do they have to push it back in themselves? Or is it simply irreducible? Three, are there any complications? For example, are there features of obstruction, such as vomiting or distension or constipation, particularly at times when the hernia is not reduced? Are there any features that might suggest strangulation, such as fever? Four, finally, don't assume every lump is a hernia. There may be pertinent questions you may want to ask to look at other potential diagnoses such as lipomas, pseudoaneurysms, urological diagnosis. The list is endless. When you examine a groin lump, stick to the principles. Look, listen and feel. Here we're going to use a male as an example. With the patient standing, first identify the two key landmarks the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. Visualize the inguinal rings with the deep ring a couple of centimeters above the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and the superficial ring just above and medial to the pubic tubercle. Then say what you see. Ask the patient to cough and see if there is a visible cough impulse. Now together with palpating the lump it is imperative that you describe its origin in relation to the position of the pubic tubercle. Hernias above and medial to the pubic tubercle are typically inguinal, and those below and lateral are likely to be femoral hernias. This is an important distinction. Bear in mind, small direct hernias that are confined to the inguinal canal may not be demonstrably medial to the pubic tubercle, but they should still originate from above it. If the hernia is in the scrotum, you will not be able to get above it as it originates from the inguinal canal. Ask the patient to cough again and see if you can feel a cough impulse. Note if the lump is tender and gently try to reduce it. If it is reducible then see if you can control the hernia by firmly pressing over the deep ring which is a couple of centimeters above the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. Ask the patient to cough again and if the hernia fails to reappear but removing your hand reveals the hernia once more with yet another cough then you are demonstrating the ability to control the hernia at the deep ring and demonstrating that in order for the hernia to come out, you need to relax the pressure at the deep ring. So this means the hernia is likely to be indirect. However, if control of the deep ring does nothing to prevent the hernia from coming out when the patient coughs, then it is likely to be a direct hernia. Finally, you could have a listen to see if there are any bowel sounds in the hernia. You could also shine a pen torch at a scrotal lump to see if it transilluminates, and this would indicate a hydrocele or fluid in the scrotum. Now the only caveat to all of this is that in practice you may not always be sure the patient's lump is a hernia. You may just be presented with a groin lump and you need to fully characterise it clinically. For example by noting its size, shape, whether or not it is fluctuant or pulsatile to name but a few important characteristics as there are many other potential differential diagnoses for a lump in the groin. The words we use to characterise a hernia need not be complicated. Very simply, an incarcerated hernia is, well, incarcerated in that it cannot escape, just like a person who might be incarcerated in a prison. An incarcerated hernia is the same as an irreducible hernia. A strangulation describes a hernia with vascular compromise, so the neck is so tight it impedes venous return. This causes venous congestion, edema, and eventually arterial insufficiency and necrosis of the hernia. This is a surgical emergency. Another surgical emergency is the obstructed hernia. If bowel is involved in a hernia, the lumen may be obstructed so that it causes bowel obstruction. 
Now, you may have an incarcerated or an irreducible hernia, but that doesn't mean it is strangulated or obstructed, although there will be a risk of it progressing. Risk factors for a complication from an inguinal hernia include painful or inguinoscrotal hernias, patients who are older than 55, and hernias that have been present for less than three months. But I wouldn't have thought you'd need to remember all of those details for your exams. Here we'll just concentrate on imaging. Ultrasound, you need to appreciate, is not very sensitive at picking up groin hernias, so we only really use it sometimes to make sure we're not missing small hernias. We could also use ultrasound to help differentiate between inguinal and femoral hernias, or to look for other causes of lumps in the groin or scrotum. CT can be used with a high degree of accuracy to diagnose groin hernias. In an emergency, it might also tell us whether a hernia is a cause of bowel obstruction, or again, to help us distinguish between inguinal and femoral hernias. The key thing to remember here is diagnosing a groin hernia is mainly clinical, so that means a good history and examination should be able to pick them up. Groin hernias can be managed either conservatively or surgically. The first thing to realise is that femoral hernias are extremely high risk of causing strangulation or bowel obstruction, so they really need to be fixed surgically. Conservative management for inguinal hernias involves doing nothing, for example with asymptomatic inguinal hernias, or prescribing a truss, which is a garment worn that presses on the hernial orifice with the hernia reduced in order to reduce symptoms. Now, large or symptomatic hernias can be fixed surgically by reducing the contents and placing a mesh. Now remember, hernias don't fix themselves, so at some point in the future, a complication may occur if it's not fixed. So we've talked about femoral hernias occurring mainly in little old ladies and inguinal hernias mainly occurring in men. Direct hernias arise medial to the inferior epigastric vessels and protrude through the posterior wall of the inguinal canal and indirect hernias arise lateral to the inferior epigastrics through the deep ring and into the cord. Now groin hernias can be symptomatic or can be painful causing obstruction or strangulation, particularly in femoral hernias. When you examine them, decide where the lump arises in relation to the pubic tubercle and see if the lump is reducible. Imaging is not often needed as groin hernias can mostly be diagnosed clinically. And finally, femoral hernias need an operation and inguinal hernias can be offered an operation, especially large inguinoscrotal hernias in older patients. The alternative is a truss. Thanks for watching. Feel free to leave any comments or feedback and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.